Hey guys, welcome back to my series called Introducing, where I show you all sorts of rare and strange instruments from the past. Today's instrument is one of my absolute favorites. This is the Baroque guitar. So the Baroque guitar, or the Chitarra Española, as the Italians called it at the time, was popular between 1600 and 1750, roughly, although it was actually still being played well into the early 19th century. One of the things I love so much about this guitar is that it was played everywhere from the bars and streets of 18th century Madrid all the way to the court of King Charles II, and even by King Charles II himself, who studied with the famous Italian guitarist Francesco Corbetta. Now, if you've been to many art museums, you've probably come across the painting of a woman holding a Baroque guitar, or a man serenading a, a love interest under a tree. And in fact, people like me, who specialize in these historical instruments, we actually use those paintings as evidence for how the instruments were played. Okay, so here we have the beautiful Baroque guitar. And if I hold up a modern guitar, you can see the difference in, in size. It's a much thinner hourglass shape. It's also uh, quite a bit lighter. There are two main ways of playing this instrument. Puntiato, which means plucking, and raschiato, which means strumming. Here's a short example of puntiato. Now the second style, rasciato, strumming, is really where all the fun begins. It's one of the best parts of playing this instrument because you really become a percussion player. The guitarists of the time developed all these really intricate patterns of strumming using different combinations of fingers, and I think by far the coolest pattern that I've come across is called a rapico. A rapico is when you take your middle finger and your thumb, and by rotating your forearm back and forth, you can play very fast 16th notes. So it's just like middle, thumb, thumb, middle, and you just keep rotating your arm back and forth. Slow it sounds like. Okay, so let's go over the main differences between these two. Modern guitars have what are called machine heads, these gears up here, which make it very easy to fine tune. Now, Baroque guitars use friction pegs. So they're very similar to violin pegs in that they're just wooden pegs that you turn and that are held in with friction. A lot of modern guitarists think that these are crude and must not work well, but actually, when they're fitted well, they're fantastic. Another main difference is that modern guitars use metal frets, these little pieces of metal here. Baroque guitar, instead of using metal frets, uses gut. And gut is intestine, dried intestines, which usually came from sheep. Um, this is real gut that I have tied around the neck here. And a lot of guitarists today, again, would think, oh, how crude. But there's a huge advantage with tied on frets and that's that you can slant and move the frets to play in what are called temperaments, and they allow you to actually play more in tune than fixed metal frets can. The modern guitar also has a very simple rectangular bridge, but the Baroque guitar is a bit more elegant, <laughs> and instead of a simple rectangular bridge, they've turned it into a curlicue mustache. Now, for one of the coolest differences, the modern guitar has an open sound hole, with a little decoration around it called a rosette. 
whereas the Baroque guitar, fitting to its name because Baroque means highly ornate, the Baroque guitar has an incredibly intricate design inside of the sound hole. Uh, this is called a rose and it's three-dimensional. It goes inside the instrument and in this case it's made of goatskin. So let's talk about the tuning. It has nine strings total, but we actually call this a five course guitar. A course is a pair of strings that we play simultaneously. So you're thinking, okay, five pairs is 10 strings, and we even have 10 pegs here. Why aren't there 10 strings? And that's because all the sources say that the first string, the high E, was always kept single. It was called the chanterelle, which means the singing string. And actually, most guitars still have 10 pegs. It's just that this one is false. <laughs> it's just for uh, symmetry. So now let's compare this tuning with that of a modern guitar. And just a quick disclaimer, I'm tuned at what's called Baroque pitch, which is A equals 415 hertz rather than 440 hertz. And that basically means I'm tuned one half step below modern concert pitch. Okay, the first string on the modern classical guitar is a high E and it sounds like this. The first string on the Baroque guitar is the same. The second string is a B. And here's where it gets interesting. I have two Bs. <laughs> two Bs, and I pluck them as one. The third string is G, and again I have two Gs. Next we have a D, and I actually have the same D on this guitar, but I also have an upper octave D. That means that when I play on that string, I get parallel octaves. Next we have A, and Again, I have two A's, but as you can hear, they sound actually one octave higher. Now, because the guitar existed for such a long period of time in so many different countries, people experimented with different types of stringings. Sometimes they would have a low A instead of two high A's. Sometimes they would have two high D's instead of one of each. The third string also occasionally had an upper octave G on it. So compared to a guitar, this tuning is a bit odd. Most guitars start high and everything just goes lower from there. This guitar starts out high, goes lower, lower, but then it goes higher at the end. So it's sort of an inside-outside tuning. 17th century guitar players figured out that there was a big advantage to this tuning, and that was it allowed you to play what they called campanellas. So the idea is, Rather than playing a normal scale on a guitar, we can play notes cross string because of the re-entrant tuning. And what's so cool about that, as you can hear, is it allows the notes to overring like a harp. Listen again. It's a really beautiful sound, and it's also easy to play fast and elegantly. One of the best examples of this technique comes from a Fandango by Santiago de Mercia. So this last piece was called Fandango, and Fandangos were so popular in the 18th century, especially in Spain and Chile and Argentina, the police authorities and the church got together and tried to ban that style of music from being played because apparently it made people so rowdy that it caused constant street fights, sexual promiscuity, and even manslaughter. So this was kind of the rock and roll of the late 18th century. Baroque music is actually quite a bit like jazz in that there's so much improvisation going on. Whether you're adding extra notes and trills, or mordants, or when you're strumming, adding extra divisions by instead of playing the written rhythm, which could be you can play and that's up to the player. It can change every single time you play and that's part of the magic of the music. Baroque guitarists, like all Baroque musicians, were expected to memorize a long series of chord progressions called grounds. 
This is a bit like today, how any good guitar player can just jam on the 12-bar blues. So if someone says, hey, let's jam on the 12-bar blues in A, you say, let's go. So I hope you think this instrument is as cool as I do. Uh, if you haven't already, subscribe, uh, because I'm going to be doing more videos in my Introducing series, where I'm going to teach you about more interesting plucked instruments from the past. So thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.